Heavenly Father, we are grateful uh, this night. Thank you so much for uh, the gift of life. Uh, thank you for uh, blessing us, Lord, uh, this day uh, with the blessings of a new birth that indeed, Lord, you can gather us uh, together because, Lord, our craving and our desire for your word, uh, Lord, is a continuous uh, desire within us. Thank you for saving us, Lord, uh, from um, our past and things, Lord, that we couldn't even save ourselves from uh, that hopelessness that we might have been. And today, God, we are yours. We have a new nature in us and we can indeed crave uh, for your obedience. So we pray that you may help us tonight. Speak to each and every one of us in different situations, uh, Lord, in different uh, points in our, in our lives and help us that uh, in the next uh, one hour or so, Lord, you help us understand and and be convicted and convinced of your word, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So, Karibuni um, Sana, again, for today's Bible study. And uh, we are looking at 1 Peter. We are going through 1 Peter. Uh, today is our second Bible study. We are going through uh, chapter 1 from verse 13 all the way to chapter 2, verse 3. Um, as a way of a reminder, um, of our last session uh, from chapter from chapter one from verse one all the way to verse twelve, I will look at that uh, briefly, and then uh, we are going to read the passage for today and see what lesson we are we are seeing or we can hear God speak to us uh, today. So as a recap, last week we looked at um, elect exiles through a new birth and. Um, we were reminded that indeed the triune God, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are involved in our election or in our own salvation. And we saw how that happened and uh, how that then leads to the explanation that Peter uh, later on, who, who spent his time uh, or actually around 10 verses explaining. And that's the whole idea that because we are sinners, we needed a change in our own hearts. And that's what he's calling a new birth. And this birth, new birth is into a living hope. Uh, our identity is secure. Uh, that's what Peter is trying to remind us. And he showed us uh, through that, uh, uh, through those verses, that indeed the inheritance that we have, the living hope of our inheritance is indeed secure. Why? Because the inheritance is kept by God himself and we, who are in the inheritors or the heirs of that inheritance, we are also kept by that God. And that mercy that we receive, instead of punishment, we receive that uh, grace of God. The mercy we receive has birthed us into a living hope. And that living hope is into an inheritance that is imperishable, can never perish, spoil, or fade. And that inheritance, at the end, he qualifies it and says, it is the salvation of our souls. In other words, we are assured that at the end of the day, uh, of, of, at the end of the time, we, our souls will be saved. And that is something we can uh, be assured of, we can be secure in, and so our identity is secure, that we inherit heaven itself and will be with God for eternity. And of course, he reminded us of trials that come to strengthen our faith and prove our the genuineness of our faith. Again, uh, we looked at how then we need to look at the way we respond to trials and the challenges that come. Uh, and indeed, that's because the people that Peter is writing to are people who are going through different trials and temptations and even persecution, and they are scattered in different parts uh, of Asia Minor. And then lastly, we looked at how why it's a privileged time uh, that we are living in. Um, and, and because of the salvation we just talked about, uh, for us, we are not like the prophets who are looking forward uh, to the uh, revelation of a Messiah, um, uh, that is his death and resurrection. We already look back and see that that has already happened. And what we are looking forward to is the second revelation of Christ Jesus, uh, so that through that, uh, we will have the salvation of our souls. And we so say that is important because that is where then we set up our hope. So for us, someone who is going through a hardship or a hard time, a trial, then we then look at the hope in the future, the expectation that everything will be put right. And that gives us the strength that indeed we can go through hardships today. And so for a Christian is to think that uh, even if I'm going through hardship, 
um, everything that happens in my own life is for my is for the, for my good. Uh, you know, Romans eight, um, that everything happens for the elect is for for their good. So we may not see the good now, but God is preparing something in the future, and that's a hope. But even if it doesn't happen in this part of the world, there is something greater that we can look up to uh, when Christ returns. Uh, so we, we're going to listen to the passage as Musa reads to us, Moses Mumu, and then after that, we're going to dive into that passage. Moses can read for us. Thank you, James. Uh, we are reading from First Peter, chapter 1, verse 13 to chapter 2, verse 3. ESV version. Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, since it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. And if you call on him as father who judges impartially according to, the, to each one's deeds, Contact yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile, knowing that you are ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the in the last times for the sake of you, who though, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart, since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and abiding word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass with us and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. And this word, of, and this word is the good news that was preached to you. So put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. Like newborn infants, Long for the pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up into salvation, if indeed you have tested that the Lord is good. And that's the word of the Lord. Thank you, Moses. Uh, thank you for that very clear reading. And uh, we're going to look at, because we are clear about our identity, that is a new birth, uh, the Lord has birthed us into this living hope and an inheritance that is imperishable, because we are clear about that and we are assured of it, how should we then live in light of our new identity? And what we'll see in these verses, I've given four points there, is one, we should live hopefully. Uh, from verse 13, we should live hopefully. Verse 14 to 16, we should live holy lives. In verse 17 to 21, we should live as foreigners, in fear of God, uh, and then uh, verse 22 to chapter 2, verse 3, uh, we should grow um, in salvation. Uh, we should live in, in growth of our own salvation or the new birth that uh, Christ has indeed brought to us. Let's look at the first one, how to live hopefully or living hopefully as one of the way we ought to live now that we are uh, we have a new birth. And we, what we see in verse um, 13 is a call to live hopefully. Uh, by Peter beginning the whole um, passage here with a conjunction of therefore. Uh, and I've asked there, what is the therefore? Therefore. Uh, and we need to ask ourselves what comes before it. And what comes before it is what we have actually mentioned, our own identity in Christ Jesus, the new birth into a living hope. And what Peter then moves on to see to show us is that indeed our minds are involved in how we live our lives in hope. And he uses words of our minds being alert and sober. And I've said there that the word sober brings the context of alcohol or drunkenness 
So when someone is, is drunk, we say they are not sober. Uh, there's something, they are not seeing things clearly. And it's the same, almost the same word that uh, Peter is using here. And, and what, if we think about a little bit about drunkenness, drunkenness distorts reality. Uh, it makes things insensitive, it makes people insensitive or things insensitive to what is true, real and valuable. Uh, drunkenness clouds our judgment. It slows our reflexes and provokes us to do things we will normally not do. I know you have heard of people say, I was drunk. Um, someone uh, was trying to push um, someone's door another time. And uh, when the person was asked, why are, why are you pushing my door? And they said they were drunk. They didn't know why they were doing what they were doing, uh, probably under the influence of alcohol. And what Peter is trying to bring here is for us to live lives that are pleasing to God is that our minds must be involved in it. And many times when you think about our own work with God and even spiritual warfare itself, uh, we tend to think about it as if it's just something that is outside there or just a spiritual element only. But we can actually see from here, from this passage, and we're going to see that, that Peter is have, making a case for the mind, that our mind needs to be alert and sober, that what we feed our mind with, what we think about matters because it helps us to set our minds uh, on the alert mode and even to be sober when we're thinking about where we are setting our hope. And I just thought about this as a helpful thing because when we are in hard situation, and remember the people Peter is writing to are in hard situation, their mind might go to different ways or different means in which they can get their hope. And as they think about those things, they can act on them. But what he's saying here is, uh, have your mind alert and fully sober so that you set your, that mind, you set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. So we need to live hopefully by the fact that uh, Jesus Christ has birthed us into this new hope. So we need to set our mind, the object of our hope um, is in the future grace to be revealed when Jesus returns. And so we need to have our hope uh, our mind, sorry, continuously uh, drinking and spending time thinking about the hope and the new birth that we have in, in Christ Jesus. And that is an aspect of our own mind. So someone can say that when we are not clear in our mind, and you're going to see in verse 14, when he says, when we were not believers, we used to live in ignorance. Again, an aspect of the mind. When our mind is not clear about some truths of the Bible, what will happen is we will live according to the idea of how, you know, whatever we are thinking about uh, looks like. So if our idea of God is wrong in our own mind, then that's how we're going to think and, and act about God. If our idea of ourselves is wrong in our own mind, then that's how we are going to live our lives. And someone said that a power encounter is a place where you come and bring someone to a truthful understanding of who God is because you can show them from the word so that that truth is applied in their hearts to believe of who God is and what he has done for them. And so our mind in that sense is involved uh, when you're thinking about living hopefully. So at the object of our hope then, well, the thing we need to keep on thinking about is the future grace to be revealed when Jesus returns. And I found that also interesting because he's saying, by the way, when Jesus returns, that is the hope and expectation that we are having. And that is grace. It's undeserved favor that Jesus will return. And that is something that we are looking forward to. Not because we have obeyed all the law, but it's because of the grace that uh, God will have revealed to us in Christ Jesus. So we come in by grace. The new birth is by grace. And actually, the culmination of it, the result of it, is also by grace. We will see Jesus Christ by grace. Um, and, and someone has, you know, we, we ask that question, what will, will we say when we get to heaven? And, and you know, the, if there will be a huge door uh, and, and the, an angel asks us, why should we let you into heaven? It's not because we are we were right or because we achieved or obeyed every law of the Lord, but it's because of the grace that will have been revealed that time, that is Jesus Christ when he returns. The second way that we need to live is um, we need to live a holy life. Uh, we need to live holy lives. That's verse 14 to verse 16. And again, what we see here is that 
uh, new birth results in to obedient children. Now, when we remember the whole identity is pegged on the whole idea of a new birth. We have bo been born afresh because we are sinners. For us to obey God, there needs to be a change in our own hearts. Now, Peter takes that idea a little bit further and says, when someone is born anew, when you have a new birth, they, they take that new nature that they now have. And so because we have, we have been elected for obedience, we can't help it. And the new birth therefore brings obedient children. And what these children don't do, as you can see, is that they don't live according to the ways of the world. In verse 14, uh, B, um, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. So when we have a new birth, it brings a new nature in us. And that nature then says, you can't live as the world is living. You can't live uh, as the people of the world are living. There is something different in us. There is, we have been born afresh or anew. Um, and there is a change in us. So we don't conform to the world. But instead, the, the word but there in verse 15, we live in accordance to the calling and in accordance to God's nature that is already in us. So in accordance to the calling is, is, a, is a very helpful one because remember we are called for God's own holiness and obedience. So he wants a people for himself. So the calling is to be followers of Christ Jesus. And in that sense, then we ought to live holy lives according to the calling, as the calling to follow God himself, and also according to the new nature or the new path that God has brought into our own lives. So with, the, with, those, with that in mind, so we don't live as the world. And someone, you can say there are two ways to live. We can live in accordance to the world, or we can actually live in accordance uh, to the God's holiness. And he goes on to qualify that, and he says, um, we ought to live holy uh, because God, the one who has called us, is holy. Uh, and so I, I, I thought there, what does it mean when we talk about holy? And the word holy means sacred, according to God's standard. And actually what he's calling us to, to, to holiness, he's saying, I am holy. For you to commune and be with me, you must come to my level of holiness. Now, um, that means that we have been set apart. This, we are sacred to God. We, we are devoted to God. And how we live our life should actually show who we are. Uh, and I, I, I did give there uh, examples of how uh, in, the, in the Old Testament, when, we say, when they say, uh, be holy, and that's part of what um, Peter quotes from Leviticus uh, in end of verse 16, be holy because I am holy. He quotes from Leviticus 11 verse 44. And when you go back to Leviticus, there's a list of things or ways in which Israel are supposed to live. And they are, that means because you are different, I am calling you to be a different people from what the world or how the world is living. And they have a temple that is holy to the Lord, dedicated, devoted to God. They have things that are sacred. They are devoted and set apart for God. They are distinct and different. And in the context that we, we are looking at in 1 Peter, what Peter is saying, we, our holiness must be at the same level with God if we are indeed to have a relationship and a communion with him. Now, that sounds scary because I don't know who among us can uh, attain to the level of holiness of God. And uh, when we think about the laws of the Old Testament, we are supposed to fulfill all of them because that's the level of holiness of God. Uh, someone may ask then, how do I live a holy life? And th this verse is intended to bring that feeling in us, how helpless it is to get to this level of God's holiness. And when we feel that helpless, helplessness, that we are called to live holy, yet we are not living holy lives. And we're going to see later on some of the issues that Peter is raising uh, among us, the people that he's writing to. When we don't get to that level, what do we do? We go back to verse 13. We set our hope on the grace that is in Christ Jesus, that has been brought to us in Christ Jesus and that we're actually looking forward to as the hope. That's why we need to set the hope in uh, the future when Christ Jesus is revealed. That helps us to live holy lives now and continuously fighting sin. Um, and, the, and therefore, uh, when we think about holy living, we are, we, it brings that 
desire and need in us that indeed we are helpless in our own self. We are hopeless. We need to go back to the grace. And that Peter continues in that line in verse 18. Um, and, and in verse 18, he says, for you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you are redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors. So he says, yes, you need to be holy. And that's the calling that God is calling us to. But you can't attain to that holiness. So you can go back to the hope uh, that we have set our mind on in verse 13. But also we can look forward uh, to verse 18 and see that when we remember that our birth is not by our own, any of our own achievement, and indeed we have a future hope, then we can indeed say that we can continue fighting sin, but also we can continue looking at the grace. So they are both means of graces. We continuously look at the grace, see how much God loves us, and he has given his son for us, but then how unholy we are, and therefore we go back to that grace to hold on to it, to set our mind, to keep our mind alert and sober on that future hope that we have in Christ Jesus. So the call to holiness should show us how deprived and unable to attain to God's level of holiness. We should bring the hopelessness in ourselves and anything else we might be tempted to hope in. We should then lead us, lead us to putting our hope in the grace that is to be revealed. So we continuously hold on to Christ. We continuously go back to that grace because the level of holiness is so great. We can't achieve to it. Uh, but we can't achieve it, but God has given us his grace. And so we set our hope in the grace that is even going to be revealed in the future. And that's the one that, was, that will uh, assure us uh, of the certainty of, us, of the salvation of our soul. Uh, we can go on to the next uh, slide. The number three thing that we are, uh, we are called to live uh, or how we are called to live is we are called to live as foreigners in the fear of God. And you look, you see that in verse 17, since you call on a father who judges each person's work in, impartially, live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. So Peter then comes to this verse 17 and what he does is, he brings us the idea of a father who is God our father. Um, and that means he, we have a relationship with him as our father. But then he says he's also the judge. And, and that's an interesting picture of who God is. So because most of the time we swing to one side, we see the relationship, the grace that he gives to us, uh, the love he gives to us as a father. But we forget to see that he's also the one who punishes sin and he's the judge of all our deeds. So we, we have a relationship with him, but we must remember he's also the judge who judges just sin uh, impartially. And what should this do to us? It should make us live in fear of his judgment. And I've asked there, could this fear be a means of leading us to persevere? And, and I thought about it when I am sinning and I forget that God will punish the sin that I'm about to commit, then if I don't live in the light of the judgment of God, therefore I will continue to live or habitually live in sin. And what this is doing is then becomes a means of grace again, that indeed we see God the Father who is so gracious, but one who also punishes sin. And therefore, every time I am reminded God will punish this sin, then I go back and I desire to even obey him more. So the fear of God here, the reverent fear, which I've said there, the fear of a judge takes us to the safety of our redemption in the precious blood of Jesus. So we run away, uh, fear, sin, to the safety of a father. And the opposite, unholy fear, runs away from a judge to the safety of morality, religion, achievements, and anything else that we might be tempted uh, to run to. So holy fear, which is he's talking about reverent fear or holy fear in some version, it makes us run away from sin to the arms of the safety of that grace that have been revealed to us in Christ Jesus. And holy fear makes us run away from God and we put our hope in other things. We put our safety in morality or how well we can achieve uh, or tick boxes of how much we have been able to do or achieve for God. But holy fear makes us run to that safety 
uh, of God. And that's what, again, he will talk about uh, later on, how we have been bought. Our salvation um, has, has come to us by the redemption um, of, of which Christ has achieved. And the whole idea here of redemption or a ransom in some version is the idea that we were slaves. Uh, we are living in the slavery of our own uh, sinfulness, um, at the emptiness of life, and it's been handed down to, to us from our ancestors. So sin is inherent in us, uh, and therefore uh, we can't help but sin. But when the new birth comes, it changes that. In other words, God ransoms us, pays a price for our own freedom and uh, redemption. That means that for us to walk freely, it must have cost God something. And that's what Peter is saying there. It cost him his own son, the precious blood uh, of Christ, a lamb without a blemish or defect. And again, going back to Old Testament, uh, words there. If you remember Exodus 12, uh, they were supposed to give the sacrifice of a lamb without a blemish. Uh, and so that when the angel of death comes, uh, he will pass over because there is blood rubbing shed in that family. But if they did not give the sacrifice, when the angel of death comes over, they, he will actually kill the firstborn. So, so either way, there is a death in each home in Egypt at that time. Either it's the death of a lamb without a blemish, or it is the death of a firstborn. But what has happened for us uh, is that when the when we have this, this sacrifice, um, uh, we have been you know bought or ransomed by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. It cost His Son. It is costly sacrifice, yet it is free for us. So it's free salvation, free grace, but it cost God his own son. And that's why he's saying that purchase, that ransom, that redemption that we have has indeed been achieved uh, in our own lives, not of things that are perishable. God did not come buying us with silver or gold. And he actually saying, even silver and gold are perishable. If you put your hope in the most precious metal, in the things that, uh, you know, um, in this world that we can try and put our hope in, then those things are perishable. And you can imagine gold. Uh, right now, um, in Corona season, people are saying they are putting their wealth in terms of gold. So people are buying gold. The prices of gold are keeping on going high. Why? Because people want to keep their wealth in gold, which probably has uh, doesn't lose value over time. But even that gold itself is perishable. Uh, and the extreme analogy Peter uses here is actually to show us there is nothing that we can put our hope that is imperishable apart from Christ Jesus and his redemption for us and what he has done for us. And then lastly in verse 20 there, uh, lastly in this uh, number three, is that our salvation is not divine after thought. So Peter reminds us that um, our salvation, the one who has achieved it, which is Christ Jesus, through his precious blood uh, that has been poured for us, is not an afterthought because the Savior was chosen before creation. Um, he is from eternity to eternity. He was there before we were even born. He was there before the world was created. And therefore, he can only be God. Um, he can only be God and sufficient for our own redemption. How can God be satisfied with the sacrifice that has been given for us, the ransom that has been given for us? It can only be possible if the sacrifice is God himself. And the one who comes incarnate, takes the form of um, you know, our human form, is God himself. Why? He was there before eternity. He was there before creation. That means the sacrifice he gives, the ransom his, he gives, is perfect for our salvation. And that's amazing news. Uh, that's great news to see that indeed that should lead us to leave as foreigners uh, in the fear of God, the one who judges, so that we can continuously uh, bring these two together, the grace and the fear that leads us and helps us to persevere and grow uh, as we continue to wait uh, on the hope that is that will be revealed to us. And which leads us to the fourth uh, point, uh, which is how then do we grow? Um, and, and the point there, how to grow in the new birth. So we, be, we have been born anew in the new birth. Um, uh, God is calling us to live um, 
um, as holy people. He's calling us to set our mind on the hope that is going to be revealed. He's calling us to leave us foreigners uh, in the world and in the fear of him. And then how then do we continuously grow in our new birth or our salvation? And the number one we see, the number one way we can grow in our salvation, that we, the new birth that we have, is through continuous obedience of the truth that leads to purification and cleansing. So when, when, if we don't take, take into mind uh, the things that God is speaking to us and the truth he's speaking to us, the challenge is we may never come to a point of obedience. And when we obey and see God's word working in our own lives, we are not encouraged to obey another time. And what he's saying here is, if you look at verse 22, now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth, so the purification, the continuous growth and sanctification happens when we have obeyed the truth to come into salvation. But when we come in, we continuously obey the truth and keep growing in the new path. And you're going to see that at the end uh, of the whole idea of craving for the word of God uh, and, and, and what God is speaking to us. So we, we continuously, uh, we are in continuous obedience of the truth that leads to purification and cleansing. And he gives an example there. Um, that obedience to truth leads to um, sincere love for each other, love for one another. It leads to good relationships because we have experienced the, um, the mending of our own relationship with the Father. And because we have experienced that mending of our own relationship, we ought then in, within a Christian community, within a church setting, to live lives uh, in a sense that we are loving one another, to love one another deeply. Um, um, and, and I think it's hard, um, the word there is hard to love those who are not like us, those who differ, uh, those who look unlovable. But in, in a Christian family or a Christian setting or a church, what Peter is saying, we ought to love everyone deeply. And that's a huge challenge uh, for us. And what's, a, what's the motivation of our loving each other deeply? It is our new birth. Look at what he says, verse 23. For you have been born again, not of perishable seed. In other words, for me to love a fellow believer uh, in church or who is a believer, I have to be reminded that God loved me who was actually unlovable. And I have said there, show me someone who does not love another believer, and I will show you someone who does not understand the imperishable seed of the grace of God, our salvation. Because at the core of our own salvation is a God who loves the unlovable, is the God who loves those who differed and rebelled against him. And when we continuously think about that, set our hope on that salvation, then we get power and strength to love those among us who are unlovable. And then goes on to show us that actually, instead of people putting their hope on that which is imperishable, they can put their hope on people, uh, all hopes, all people who pass away. And that's the verse uh, that has been quoted there from Isaiah. All people are like grass. If you think about yourself, you just need to take your, a photo of you 10 years ago, or five years ago, and you now, and you realize you are fading away. You are growing old. Uh, the photo can show it. And therefore, putting our hope in ourselves, in someone else, or in the things of the world that are perishable, is putting our hope on things that will pass away. But instead, we put our hope on the imperishable seed that will never perish. And therefore, we read ourselves uh, of malice, deceit, hypocrisy, envy and slander and why is because they cause fights amongst believers and this is the the thing so instead of us loving one another because we are not continuously looking at the new birth that christ has achieved for us we now go to fighting within community so two ways are not to belong to a christian community one is to be indifferent about it and to think christian community doesn't matter the church doesn't matter so we stay away from the christian community but another way is to come into that community and start causing fights within that community. And if you look at all these things that have been listed there, is the way we relate with other people, malice, deceit, hypocrisy, envy and slander. Uh, if we go on to the next slide, I have tried to define each of them uh, so that we can see what you're talking about. Malice is evil that carries with it hostility and intention to harm. So you come into the community, but you have intention to harm. 
uh, or actually um, you know to do other other people harm and then deceit is concealing or misrep misrepresenting the truth uh, probably of who you are how you're living your life or hypocrisy is the pretense of our identity we live lies probably mask our own lies outside but inside we are living totally different envy is holding ill towards someone because of an advantage over us we see them uh, but we hold ill towards them because they have an advantage over us slander is speaking evil of someone to bring them harm and as you can see in all this the bottom line is instead of loving one another deeply we are busy undoing one another so we are causing fightings amongst the christian community and why is that so it is because we are not continuously looking at the, how we have been birthed afresh anew of an imperishable seed uh, that is actually uh, the, comes through the hearing of God's word. As you're going to see, is the next bit that um, Peter talks about: um, crave for spirit, pure spiritual milk. So the first thing of how we need to grow is um, continuous obedience of God's truth and God's word, and the second one is craving for pure. Uh, spiritual milk uh, in verse two chapter two verse one therefore uh, because of you know the growth that is happening because of the call to live holy uh, set our um, uh, live uh, hope life hopefully and also uh, to live in awe of god on the fear of god and to live as foreigners therefore we need to read ourselves of these things malice deceit hypocrisy envy and slander and and instead of focusing on those things we focus on um, the spiritual milk, pure spiritual milk. The word craving is a strong desire uh, because we have a new birth, because we have a new nature, because we have tasted and see that the Lord is, is, is good. We can't help it but crave for spiritual milk. And again, he uses the whole idea like newborn babies. Remember, we have a new birth. We are like newborn babies. We have been born into a living hope. Like newborn babies crave for spiritual milk that's what a baby does because they can't live they can't grow without uh the milk and and it so talks about pure milk um you know uh, pure spiritual milk it's not just any milk it's pure it's the word of god uh and it goes on to quantify that and it says uh like newborn babies crave for, for pure spiritual milk so that by it you may grow up in your salvation now that you have tasted that the lord is good so there is that continuous desire for the word of god so what what can we learn from this um if you go on to the next slide in terms of questions i have four questions for us um as we think about this one is um which area of your conduct have you failed to obey god and maybe you can spend some time thinking about that and how was your thinking uh, or what made you disobey so think about an area you feel you haven't obeyed god maybe it's uh, malice or hypocrisy uh, or it could be anything else and um, what thinking if you look back what thinking did you have at that time maybe about God about yourself or probably what you wanted to achieve at the end of that disobedience um, what thinking did you have maybe a, a quick 30 seconds to think about that in your own life um, what area of your conduct have you failed to obey God and what were you thinking at that time 20 seconds. And maybe as we think about that is to just then go back to what Peter is calling us to. And what is he calling us is to put our minds on alert and sobriety or sober mode, is to continuously a drink and desire uh, to feed our minds what is truthful about God and about ourselves and the hope that we have. So probably part of the thinking we could have had at that time is the thinking that when I do this thing, I will be secure. I will be more satisfied with life. I will be more, um, uh, you know, um, 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 independent or something like that. That's the probably the thinking that drives that. And indeed, what we are doing by going that direction is we forget what Christ has done for us. So we are not setting our mind on the hope, on the grace that is will be revealed when Christ returns. And the second question is, do you think of God's judgment and redemption in your daily lives? 
Does it help us to stay away from disobedience? Uh, so when we are thinking about that, probably it's a habitual sin or something that we do, mal uh, malice uh, or envy. As we, as we get to that point, do we ever think about God who actually judge what we're about to do? And, and does that take us to a point of thinking, I need to go a different way. I need to go a different direction. Um, and it could, not, it could be that, you know, we are not malicious or something like that, but it could be that we are not loving enough. We are not loving those among us in our Christian community deeply, as um, Peter is calling us to. And that is, are you loving to other believers or marked by the malice, deceit, envy, hypocrisy, slander? Your, uh, the reason you, you probably talk about other people is so that you malign them and you have an ill motive that cre uh, kills Christian community. Um, and yet the opposite should be true. It is for us actually to think more of how can we um, uh, grow into the deep love for one another because Christ has loved such a people like us who um, and, and are unlovable. And do you crave finally there for your growth in the word and how is this happening in your life today? Uh, so is there a craving uh, for, your, uh, for, for your growth uh, through God's word? Or are you thinking it will happen haphazardly, a growth? Um, and there is a danger then, if we look into our own lives and we don't see that craving for, um, for God's word, um, probably we need to go back and ask ourselves, are we actually Christians? Do we have a new birth? Uh, but also is to find, to ask ourselves, what is competing with a crave for God's word? Are we, uh, you know, going through, uh, are we uh, uh, being preoccupied with too many things that God's word is not a priority anymore? Um, are we, you know, getting consumed with too much busyness in this world that God's word is not a priority? And therefore, we are not feeding our soul. We, we are not growing. Uh, that could be the question. Also, could be the question that we are asking ourselves: Are we craving for the true word of God, uh, and are we continuously uh, growing in God's word? Uh, so, uh, we, we're going to stop there. Um, several things, just to remind ourselves: because we are, we have a new identity, a new birth. Therefore, we are obedient children. Uh, we set our minds on the hope of the grace that is in Christ Jesus. We live as foreigners in fear of God and the judgment that is to come as a means of grace. And we continuously grow as Christians and we crave uh, for uh, the spiritual, true spiritual milk, uh, which is the word of God each and every time. So we will stop there and um, I will pray uh, and then we will have any, take any questions if there is any um, as we look forward uh, to next time. And then Pastor Fidel will close for us at the end. Uh, Heavenly Father, we are grateful. Uh, thank you for this huge reminder of how much uh, you have loved us, uh, we who are unlovable, we who did not deserve your grace and mercy, and yet, Lord, you loved us. And you call us today to live uh, as those who are hopeful, uh, as those who uh, to live a holy life, uh, Lord, even to uh, live as foreigners, those who are sojourners, that this world is not our home. Our home is in heaven uh, with the Father. And so we pray that God, you may help us as we keep on growing. And in this journey, uh, we help, help us, Lord, to um, uh, continuously crave and desire for the growth in our own hearts and in our own lives. Uh, for this we pray, trusting and believing in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, if there is any question, I uh, will welcome any question. And then uh, Pastor Fidel will close for us. Um, okay. okay, Pastor Fido, go on. Ready. Okay, yeah, I can see Moses Dorito is asking, our judgment by God happens now or in our present life. What form would you say this takes? When would you say God is punishing me for my sin? Um, so uh, I, have, I have learned to think about, the same way we think about salvation, it's both in the past, present, and in the future. Uh, so we were saved, we are being saved on a daily basis, and we will be saved when Christ returns. That has helped me to also think about the same in terms of judgment. Uh, so uh, by Christ coming into the world, in John he says, the world is already judged. Anyone who does not believe in him is already judged. 
Uh, and the, then there is a continuous judgment. Uh, we're going to see that later in Peter where he says, some of us will be going through hard times or suffering because of our wrongdoings, because of the things you have done wrong. And actually the example he gives is like a thief. If a thief probably steals today, get caught, uh, probably some people will clobber him. That's part of judgment or the arm of the law will take um, you know, that up and they will be jailed. Um, so that's part of the judgment. So it is also in the present because God has given that authority to the government. But also the worst of them is when Christ returns. So in t for us who are believers, when he comes back, we'll get the, our inheritance, which is salvation of our souls. But for those who are not believers, they will get the punishment for their sins. So the same way we said uh, in, in Egypt, when the angel of death was passing over, any place that did not have a sacrifice, then the firstborn would die. And even, even when Christ returns, uh, those who will not have put their faith in Christ um, will die. And that's eternal death. And that's the worst death. Um, uh, you know, even present judgment can be judged today and punishment happens, but that person can sp still be forgiven um, uh, and attain salvation at the end. So we can say some who experience some judgment now, punish, punishments now by authorities, the way the consequences of our own life, uh, living today. But then uh, we can actually say uh, we can learn from that. And judgment is also a means of grace that God keeps us away uh, from, uh, you know, uh, from His own eternal damnation. So He reminds us actually, I am still God the Judge. I still hold. Um, uh, you know, my, my, my judgment on you. And which goes, goes back to what Samson the Daima is saying, can the fear of God uh, lead to a holy life? Yeah, it should, because when I fear judgment, I stay away from danger. Um, um, so if I tell a child, don't cross the road because you'll be hit by a car and die, the fear of that warning leads me to stay away from the road and I, I will actually be have my life. But if I don't heed to it, then I'll go and die. So the fear of the Lord then can lead to a holy life. Um, yeah, uh, I think Fidel, you can take the one by Patrick there. Right, thanks, James. Um, maybe just to add on those two questions is to say yeah. there's both positive and negative motivation. Mm -hmm. uh, finding the Bible, uh, that's just how yeah. it works. God wants us. There are places where we are exalted and uh, encouraged, exalted. Uh, we're mm -hmm. exhorted encouraged by their place where we are warned. And someone has say, uh, said that uh, when God is telling us about judgment, when he's giving us warnings, it's like taking someone to the edge of the cliff and having them look down in the sea or in the ocean and see sharks moving around and telling them, this is what happens when you are not careful, you come over to the edge of this cliff, you'll find yourself in the shark-infested waters. Uh, so yeah. <laughs> The warning works in a negative way, a negative sort of motivation for us uh, to be those who are growing in our godliness, our holiness. Now, what is the danger when believers are not craving for growth in God's word? Um, uh, thanks for that question. I think uh, some of the things are what we see there, as James has helpless, uh, helps us to see, the things of, of malice, deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander, so destroying the community of believers, uh, not loving one another, because when you are craving God's word, it means you are wanting to obey what the word is saying. But if your heart and soul is not in the word of God, then you will do the opposite of what the word of God wants you to do. So it will be the opposite of loving. It will be, uh, it will be now you know, slander, malice, and everything else. Uh, and you will forget about the salvation you have received, how precious it is. Uh, I guess you'll sit back into thinking then it is all a matter of my own flesh. Uh, you know, it's about man. Um, I think you will lose value of what you've been uh, talking about, your own identity. And then at the end, it will be a slip more of now what yourself can bring on the table instead mm -hmm. of looking and everything built around what Christ has done and how that shapes then your identity and then how you do things, how you, you, you know, your own works. It will be kind of working from the outside and trying to uh, take things in. Uh, but I think the big thing we see from this passage, I think just losing a sense of 
yeah, that community, Christian community, what it means to love other people out of a deep love and, and your own self, what it means to grow holy. Because if you're not in the word, you not know what God is, de um, is demanding of us, uh, desiring of us to grow even in his uh, holiness. Yeah, that's what I would say. Thank you. Uh, thank you. That's very helpful, Pastor Fidelia. Uh, if we don't uh, crave God's word, then we veer off the whole idea there in verse 13, our minds, then we don't, we are not sober and we don't become alert. So we are not even sure when we are in a spiritual warfare uh, or a truth warfare because our identity has been changed uh, because probably we are listening more to the world. Um, and so our idea of God, our idea of self has really changed. We are not seeing what Christ has achieved for us. Um, so, yeah. Um, yeah, unless there is any one last question, uh, Pastor Fidel can conclude for us. Hmm. Okay, uh, I think we can pray. Um, quite, quite a lot of deep stuff, really, from God's hope wherever you are. Let me lead us in just praying through the scriptures we've been uh, studying this evening and hoping the Spirit of God will be to change us according to his word. Shall we pray? Oh Lord, help us that our minds will be prepared for action. There will be those who are sober-minded and have set our hope fully on the grace that will be brought at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Many times we are tempted to set our hope on temporary things, on things that are perishable. Oh Lord, forgive us. Help us to be obedient children, not being conformed to the passions of our former ignorance. Because you have called us to be holy, you, you, you are holy. Many times we think holiness is something that we cannot attain. We read of the many of old who are holy. And we look at it in the 21st century and we wonder, can we even be holy? Can anyone be holy? Oh Lord, have mercy on us and help us to be those who are fighting for holiness. We pray that Lord help us when we, we see you, that we see you as both father and judge, that you judge impartially. Help us, the fear of you as a judge and the reality of you being a father to draw us to you, to hate our sin and to run to you and that, Lord, even when we sin, we will not be running away from you, but running to you as a loving Father, so that you may find mercy, rather than running away from you, and yet to find you as a judge out there. Mm -hmm. Oh, Lord, help us to know just how much we have been rescued, just how precious it is the salvation that we have, mm -hmm. that we have been bought not by the perishable, but by the imperishable, by the seed of, of, of that is imperishable, the precious blood of Jesus Christ, a lamb without blemish, blemish or spot. Oh Lord, we do pray that help us to know that salvation we have is not just a second plan or plan B, but this is something that uh, you have worked out from before even the foundations of the world. Oh Lord, we pray, may we continue to purify our souls by obedience to the truth. Help us not to be those who are living uh, just lives without obedience, in ignorance, which were our former ways, but to live as obedient children, having our souls purified. Lord, we pray that we may put away all those things that are of the world, malice, deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander, and help us to love one another deeply. And as new inborn, newborn babes, to long, to crave for the pure spiritual milk, that we may be nourished each and every moment so that we may grow in our salvation. Mm -hmm. This is our prayer, O God, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Thank you, Pastor Fidel, and thank you everyone for joining us today.